It's a quarter to 10 p.m. on April 2nd, 2016, and Sharon Maves is in her nightgown preparing for bed. It was an unusually warm Saturday in Auburn, Washington, so Grandma Sharon, as she was affectionately called by the children at her daycare, pulls back the curtains and opens the window of her bedroom facing 340th Street to let a little bit of the night air flow in. As she's doing this, she observes the neighbor across the street pulling out of the driveway in a blue Kia. The Anicello family, Sharon knew, often went out around this time to pick up their daughter from work. Sharon then turns around and heads to bed. Sometime later, Sharon is awakened from her light sleep by a white pickup truck resembling a Chevy Love facing the cul-de-sac and idling outside of the Anicello home. At first, she thinks it's Tom, the Anicello patriarch, drinking again. She takes a glance out and sees that it's not him, so she turns around and goes back to bed. Less than an hour later, at around 10.50pm, Sharon is again awakened, but this time by banging on her front door. She runs downstairs and opens it to two hysterical and sobbing girls, 16-year-old Felicia Anicello and 14-year-old Tabitha Anicello, children she cared for when they were little. Their mother, Julie Anicello, just told them to run for help. That's because their father, Tom, had just been shot in his sleep. What are you reporting? <clears throat> yeah, um, I need to cop to my house right away, please. Somebody's broken my house. Hey, good no. Ma'am. Did they, ma'am, did what? they hurt you? Did they hurt your husband? I, I don't know. Where he is left he? the house. We're all outside. Where's your Where husband? Come here. Ma'am, where's your husband? He's in bed. You seen that your husband was shot? He was upstairs? No, he's in bed. A single story home. Mm -hmm. Okay, you said there was a, somebody broke into your house and then somebody shot your husband? I think. I, we just, me and my girls just. Okay, and mm -hmm. what did you see that made you my think? My husband is bleeding. Your husband is bleeding where? In his face. Okay. He's in bed. We just came home. Okay, and did he say yes. that somebody done this to him? He's not talking. Is he unconscious? Um, uh, would you like me to go in and look? Because I don't know. No, no ma'am. Was he passed out when you seen him? Uh, he wasn't moving. I didn't stand there and I was hollering his name because of that. There's stuff moved around. And he's in the upstairs bedroom, is that right? No, we do not have an upstairs. Okay, he's in a bedroom? Yes. Okay. And you've seen all the stuff in the house, like, drawn about, like, it looked like somebody had broken in and stolen stuff? Yes. Possibly. I mean, there's drawers opened. Police were dispatched to the address of 4003 South 340th Street in Auburn with a canine unit as was standard protocol for what appeared to be a burglary call. There were several police cruisers and a fire truck outside of the home that was in complete disarray. In the master bedroom was 47-year-old Tom Anicello, who was laying face up with his hands resting on his chest. The TV was still on. An initial assessment ruled he died by suicide because the wound was in a very common area for suicide and he looked peaceful, one deputy said. But then deputies determined that he was killed with a single 9mm round through his right temple as he slept. The bullet, fired from a Luger handgun, exited the left side of his head and was lodged into the wall. A toxicology report found small amounts of Benadryl in his system, just enough for him to sleep. Investigators combed the home to collect as much evidence as possible, including searching for the handgun that fired the round. They were able to collect from a drawer under the box spring two handguns that were registered to Tom, but they could not find the firearm that matched the kill round. Otherwise, there was no forced entry, no broken windows, no smudges on doors or windows, and no pry marks. Veteran Detective Eleanor Brogy was the lead investigator on the case. The first order of business was figuring out what the day was like for the Anicello family. Julie volunteered those events. As is often the case with tragedies like this, this Anicello Saturday was relatively uneventful. Tom had gotten up at around 5am to go to work. When he returned, he spent the rest of the morning mowing the lawn before taking Felicia to look at cars. When they returned, he went to work on one of his daughter's cars as Felicia prepared for work at the Jimmy John's by the Auburn Mall. 
Meanwhile, Julie said she was doing chores around the home before leaving with her youngest daughter Tabitha to get some lunch from Taco Time. They returned to eat with the family. That evening, Felicia drove herself to her 5 to 9 p.m. shift at the Jimmy John's. By then, 27-year-old Amber had already been at work at the Home Depot. Amber was Tom's biological daughter from a previous relationship, so she was Julie's stepdaughter and the stepsister of Tabitha's and Felicia's. The eldest daughter had only been living in the NHL home for about a year when her father was killed. She was a bit of a black sheep in the family, she didn't have a key to the home and there were strict rules on her, which emerged from past problems with partying and drugs. As such, while living in the Anatello home, she had a curfew, she wasn't allowed to party or take drugs, and she had to ask to sleep over at friends' houses, which is exactly what she did that Friday night. Amber also couldn't drive because her license was suspended, so her parents split duties on driving her to and from those sleepovers and work at the nearby Home Depot. And that's exactly what Grandma Sharon saw that night. Julie had gotten to the vehicle at around 9.55pm with her daughters Tabitha and Felicia to pick up Amber, whose work shift ended at 10 p.m. Julie had asked Tabitha and Felicia if they wanted to go to Walmart after they picked up Amber, to which the girls agreed. Tom, at this point, was sleeping in his bed. Before the trio goes to the Home Depot, they stop by the home of Julie's father, Jean Shefflin. Julie said she had to give Jean some documents. They then leave and go to the Home Depot to pick up Amber at 10.27 p.m. The group of four then goes to Walmart and picks up some soap, gloves, sponges, juice, and two pairs of shorts. They check out at 10.40 p.m. As they are nearing home, the girls see a white pickup truck taking a sharp turn at a high rate of speed onto 340th second from 40th Street. One of the girls remembers the passenger side wheels of the truck lift off the ground as it made the turn. Julie slows down almost to a stop to remark how strange that was, and then they continue home. When they get to the driveway, the girls immediately notice something is off. Amber's cat, Mau Mau, was standing outside. Julie said she had secured the cat inside before she got in the car. When they get inside, they also notice that a drawer in the kitchen used by Tom to put miscellaneous things like his keys, cash, cigarettes, and lighter was open, with some items on top of the drawer. Moments later, Amber shouts for her mom to come to the den, which is where Amber slept on the floor. She points to the sliding glass door, which is open a few inches. Julie asks Amber if she left it open and she says no. Sensing something is very off, Julie tells the kids to leave the home. That's when Amber asks, where's dad? Amber leads the way into the hallway as Julie hurries behind her. They step inside of Tom's bedroom and almost as soon as they walk in, they are out. Julie shuts the door behind her and shouts at her daughters to run to Sharon's place as she was on the phone with dispatchers. As Amber is leaving the residence in a state of shock, she says she spots a shadow of someone, which is information she would relay to detectives. The canine dog had picked up a human smell from inside the home and took his handler to the trailer of a Terry Anderson, a neighbor of the Anicellos. Terry was known to the Anicellos, but not for the good reasons, according to some. Julie, Felicia, and Tabitha would later tell police that Tom had arguments with Terry about the company he kept, which allegedly included druggies and car prowlers, those people who steal from cars. One of those guys was a vagabond named Thomas Cooley. The canine tracked the scent to Thomas, who was sleeping in a sleeping bag under Terry's trailer. Thomas was well known to police because he had law enforcement called on him for squatting in various areas of Auburn. He was handcuffed and taken to the back of a cruiser near the Anicello home, where he was slumped over. He had a backpack with him, which he initially refused to allow police to search, but then he relented because he said he wanted to go to work later that morning. When police searched through the bag, however, they only found a change of clothes. There were no weapons or valuables suggesting he had robbed a place. He had no blood or injuries, and he was very relaxed. That would be the last time law enforcement would get cooperation from Thomas from this case. He was released, but they had his ID so they could track him. Detectives, meanwhile, looked more into Terry, who Tabitha believed had something to do with it. They heard from Julie about the several times when Tom and Terry got into arguments over where Terry parked his trailer. So detectives went to Terry's workplace, called Ernie's Fuel Stop, and discovered that he was there on the night of Tom's death. He was quickly ruled out. Besides, there were times when Terry and Tom were actually friendly with each other, and it appeared those disputes were blips on the radar. As if things couldn't get more difficult, law enforcement was unsuccessful in picking up surveillance footage of the Anicello home. To make things more puzzling, 
All those interviewed on the night of the crime said they did not hear a gunshot. Not the neighbors, nor the Anicellos. Julie consented to a swab of her car, which picked up nothing. No blood or gunshot residue, which sometimes lands on the hand when a gun is fired a short distance from the target. And investigators were still in for more bad news, when examiners ran the Prince of Thomas Cooley, who was their first detainee, against those lifted from the Anicello home, the results were amiss. The King County Sheriff's Office now had no murder weapon, scant evidence except for an unfired 9mm round found in Tom's gun holster, and some DNA swabs and fingerprints, which appeared to be just those of the Anicellos. Police put out a be on the lookout advisory for the white truck that fled the scene, but they didn't have a license plate for it. Cell tower dumps, which show phone numbers that have communicated with towers in the area, didn't generate any leads. In the early morning hours of April 3rd, Julie's parents took her and the kids to their house, where they would stay for the next seven months as the investigation dragged. Tom Manicello was described as a loving husband of 16 years to Julie and a wonderful father who was friendly and very talkative. In between the quotes and jokes on his Facebook page are photos of him, his wife, and daughters out in nature, on vacation, or at the casinos. He leaves behind messages of love for them and remarks how his job is flexible enough to let him spend that time with his family. That job was being the owner of Tommy's Produce, a produce distribution company in Kent, which he inherited from his father. By the time of Tom's death, the business had few employees, one of which was a man named René Torres. René had been working for about eight years there, from 2008 to 2016. He knew Julie, who was working at Tommy's Produce up to his death, and he was also good friends with Amber. The day after Tom's death on Sunday, detectives called René to come down to the Anicello home to speak with them. They were tipped off by Julie about some workplace conflicts that may have led to Tom's untimely passing. Renee told detectives about two men who worked for Tommy's Produce, but who were fired for poor work performance. Both firings happened within six months of Tom's death. One conflict involving a salesman named James resulted in a heated verbal argument before the fired man stormed off and never came back. Despite the animosity, Renee said neither turned physical. In another instance, Tom ordered some apples from a supplier, who couldn't deliver them on time. When the delivery guy named Scott came to drop them off, Tom told him to keep it. Scott threatened Tom with a lawsuit before storming off. Nothing physical happened there either, Renee said. Julie corroborated what Renee said about those workplace conflicts, but she went further. In Julie's version, James in fact returns to the shop and confronts Tom. When Tom tells him to leave, James takes a swing at him. Tom then punches James in self-defense, after which police are called and James is escorted out. Julie said Tom declined to press charges. In Julie's version of the Apple story, Scott follows through and sues Tom. Julie also told detectives that she remembers a time when her husband's tires were slashed at work. Detectives followed up on those leads, but nothing came out of them. Tom's mom at one point also raised the possibility of a mafia connection in Tom's lineage, but detectives found that was a distant relative. Julie held out another crumb for detectives. She speculated that Amber, her stepdaughter, may have owed people money because of her alleged drug use. I know that, um, and I don't know if Amber owes people money, but I know she has a drug issue. What's her, what is her story? She's done meth for years. We put her through treatment when she was 17. She drinks. Um, in fact, she just sent me a text, I'm assuming was for her real mom the other day. Because it said, and Tom knew about this, um, it had said, Mom, put on her stepmom, it said, Mom, my cousin Jeff wants $60 of G and I want 40 I still have the text because he was going to confront her about it next week. When did you send her to treatment for math? She was 17, so 10 years ago. Tom and I were trying to figure out what G was, and she, um... you have any idea? Well, we googled it, and it came up with math. 
With information emerging about Amber that night, detectives searched the 27-year-old's backpack and found no weapons, cash, or drugs, but did find some personal items and documents of dominion and control perhaps related to Tom's business. Amber was to manage Tom's business in the event of his death, but she would relinquish control to Julie a couple of days later because she said she wasn't in the right state of mind to manage the business. Detectives knew after they had done a sweep of the messy Inicello home on the night of Tom's death that they would likely have to return, either to search it or to speak with family members. A follow-up search of the home came on April 21st, 2016. At the time, Julie was in between the house and her parents' place cleaning and collecting some items. That search yielded a garbage bag with clothes and three 9mm bullets that matched the fatal round. Otherwise, the investigation motored on for months. Tom's family had regular checkups with investigators, but it appeared they were not any closer to an arrest. Meanwhile, Julie was speaking to anyone who would give their ear to her. That included a local news station, which interviewed her on the two-month anniversary of Tom's death on June 2nd, 2016. Two months since a man was found shot to death inside his Auburn home, his wife is speaking exclusively to Como about the crime that still has police mystified. She says somebody knows something about her husband's death, and she's speaking out in hopes that the killer will be caught. Como's Keith Eldridge live at the family's home where Tom Anicella was found shot in his bed. Keith? Yeah, it was April 2nd. Tom Anicello's wife tells me that she and her daughters were away for a bit. They came home to find him dead in his bedroom. Now, they're not staying here right now, not with a killer still on the loose. Tom Anicello, a loving husband and father to three daughters. The 47-year-old was the owner of Tommy's Produce, a fresh produce distribution company in the Kent Valley. He was killed inside his home on Auburn's West Hill two months ago. Medical examiner says he died from a gunshot wound to the head. Julie says she and her daughters had just been gone an hour. His oldest daughter and I went in and seen that there was, you know, blood on him and everything. So we ran out and called 911. Julie says the back door was open and jewelry and cash were missing, possibly an interrupted burglary. They remember seeing a small white pickup speeding away from their neighborhood. He came around the corner very squirrely, almost hit us. While detectives look at that, she also says they're looking at business rivals of Tom's, enemies he may have made along the way, and even the possibility there's a drug connection. And she revealed that she and her daughters are even being questioned. It did hurt when they asked me that, you know? I mean, I don't know why anybody would think I would do that to him. Julie says she agreed to talk with us to shake loose some leads. Yes, I would. I mean, somebody out there has to know something. Such as the mystery person who spray painted this rest in peace Tommy at the Produce Business Park. Now that was very suspicious because that happened on the one month anniversary of the uh, death. And they say that uh, they were wondering if it was gonna happen on the second anniversary of the month. That was today, it didn't happen. They really would like to talk to that person because that's not what Tom would want. They say he hated graffiti. So any leads they'd like phoned in to the King County Sheriff's Office. We're live on Auburn, Keith Eldridge. Come on in. Detectives were puzzled by the segment. That's because Julie, up to that point, never came forward and reported specific jewelry or cash that was stolen from the home. It's close to midnight on March 2nd, 2016, exactly one month before Tom's death and Bradley Robinson is panicking. His wife Leslie's in the passenger seat completely slumped over. She isn't responding. He turns up the radio and starts shouting her name. She comes to briefly, but then falls back into a state of unconsciousness. Bradley is about halfway to the hospital as he juggles maintaining control of the vehicle and keeping his wife of five years awake. Days earlier, the Robinson family, which included their son Ryder, was hit with a bad case of the flu. Bradley said his wife, who he knew since 2007, didn't work and didn't try to maintain a healthy lifestyle. He said she was overweight. The family also couldn't afford health insurance, so for many ailments, they neglected to go to the hospital. But whereas previously they were able to just wait the illness out, this one was different. Leslie was just not responding. When they got to the hospital, Bradley ran inside and began shouting for someone to get his wife from the car. Initially, he said reception told him to settle down. But when hospital staff went out to see Leslie's condition, they went into overdrive. Leslie was rushed inside, but it was too late. That night, she died of bacterial pneumonia. 
Bradley then called Danielle Tope, his manager at Seattle Gourmet Foods, and told her what happened and that he needed to take two weeks off. Bradley, who worked at the confections maker since 2008, was approved for that time off. Danielle already knew about Leslie's issues because Bradley came into work the day before and told her that he was worried because Leslie was very sick and panting. She told him to go home and take care of it. After Leslie's death, Danielle was sitting in her office when Julie Anicello came by. Julie was the receptionist at Seattle Gourmet Foods since 2014, a job she took over from Bradley when he eventually moved up to inventory. Danielle and Julie knew each other since middle school and high school and were Facebook friends, but they weren't really friends who hung out. They were reacquainted when Julie got this job. After hearing about Leslie's death, Julie walked up to Danielle's desk and while in conversation about it, slammed her fist on it and said, How did he get so lucky? The comment stunned Danielle. She said she couldn't believe anyone would say that and then walked away. She never asked her why she said that. Perhaps it was because Danielle could put the pieces together herself. Julie, it turns out, was confiding in colleagues about her allegedly abusive marriage. Danielle said Julie talked about it just about daily and conveyed that she wanted to leave the marriage in late 2015 into early 2016. She complained to anyone who would listen at work that the relationship was marred by emotional, verbal, and, to a lesser extent, physical abuse, and that there was excessive drinking, drug use, and discussions of divorce with allegations thrown around about extramarital affairs. Julie accused Tom of having several affairs in their 16 years together. The couple had mini spats on Facebook, where they hurled mean comments at each other. Julie alleged Tom had accused her of having sexual relations with men and women at work. She alleged that he would come home drunk on Mondays and Thursdays, yell at her, and demand she make him dinner at 2 a.m. In one event in February 2015, it was alleged that a drunk Tom pinned Julie to the couch while holding a gun to her head. The incident was not reported to police. Julie told a work colleague that he would get so upset while drunk that she would slip cold medicine in his drink to make him go to sleep. Julie told a detective in her initial interview that she didn't have a substance abuse issue, adding she only took one Vicodin a day, which she got from a man named Jim. Danielle was a divorcee herself, so she provided her divorce attorney's contact information and clued her in on the fact that Washington is still a community property state, which means the assets in a dissolution of marriage would be split down the middle. But after Julie gave him an ultimatum, Tom sobered up and would maintain that all the way up to his death. Tom apparently realized what drinking turned him into and he decided to turn over that page of his life. An analysis of Facebook posts paints a portrait of a man unlike that of an abusive father and husband. Instead, it shows an affectionate side with a deep love for family. Carrie Lynn, Tom's sister-in-law, would say that within his year of sobriety, he was treating others with such kindness, he was sappy, and it was like he was trying to make up for the sins of the past. But if their relationship was on the mend, it wouldn't last very long. On March 24th, 2016, just a little over a week before Tom's death, Julie told Danielle that she couldn't do it anymore. The relationship had taken a toll on her well-being and she was planning to buy a fifth-wheel trailer and hitching it on her parents' property to live there. She said she was afraid of what Tom would do if she went through with a divorce and she wanted to ensure her children weren't caught in the crossfire. Julie, who described Tom as controlling, told colleagues a week before his death that he was forcing her to quit her job at Seattle Gourmet Foods and to come work for him at Tommy's Produce. She told him she would quit. Then she made plans to take a vacation week from Seattle Gourmet to figure things out. 2018 was an outlier for the King County Sheriff's Office. It was a record year for homicide investigations, which meant detectives were working multiple cases at once. Detective Mike Glasgow testified to how busy the office was. In late 2017, he took over as lead investigator of the Anicello case from Detective Brogy, who was moving on with her career. Such a handover requires a review of all the material gathered by the team, and there was a lot in the Anicello case. But there was, of course, no smoking gun, figuratively and literally. The firearm used to kill Tom was never found, and evidence linking any sort of suspect was scarce. It was increasingly looking like if the case was going to be solved, it would be on the strength of circumstantial evidence. Detective Brogy relied a lot on Detective Glasgow in the Anicello case for digital forensics, in which he was an expert. 
After he reviewed all the evidence in the case, Detective Glasgow reached out to Julie in January 2019, nearly three years after Tom's death. The detective wanted to introduce himself to Julie, tell her that there was turnover at the helm in the investigation, and to share with her his contact information. Julie never reached out to inquire about progress in the investigation, so she was likely not wise to what was happening with personnel. Detective Hawkins, who was also working the case from the beginning, joined Detective Glasgow for the visit. Julie, who by then had moved back into the home where Tom died, welcomed the men inside. Her demeanor was described as very friendly. While Detective Hawkins spoke separately with Tabitha, Detective Glasgow followed Julie around as she pointed to various things in the home as she recounted what she saw on the night of Tom's death. She pointed to Tom's drawer in the kitchen where Tom's memorial service pamphlet was magnetically held on the refrigerator. She moved toward the back sliding glass door, which was open when they returned that night, and then into the bedroom where Tom lay. At some point, Tabitha left the home, so both detectives had a chance to sit in the living room with Julie, who was holding a napkin. Julie was very matter-of-fact about her recollection of events, stating that her relationship with Tom was getting stronger in the days leading up to his death. But then detectives noticed a sudden change in her demeanor when she spoke of one Bradley Robinson, who she said they should probably speak to. Detective Glasgow noticed her eyes turning red and welling up with tears as she aggressively fidgeted with a napkin as she spoke about her former co-worker at Seattle Gourmet Foods. But the name Bradley Robinson was not new to the detectives. In fact, they had known about him since the beginning of the investigation. That's in part because Amber, who was a mediator when Tom and Julie fought, told them about him. It's late March 2016 and Tom and Amber are sitting quietly in his truck. He had just picked her up from the Home Depot and decided there was no rush to get back home. Tom's knuckles are white as he grips the steering wheel, his head leaning forward as if he's going to bang his forehead into it. Amber, I need to tell you something, Tom started. Earlier that month, on the afternoon of March 2nd, 2016, Tom had been driving around Julie's workplace when he spotted the family's Dodge Durango parked near an abandoned building next to the Seattle Gourmet Foods. Puzzled, he pulled up nearby and stepped out. He approached, squinted, and saw Julie and a man in the back seat. Tom started to shout at Julie. The man zipped his pants and got out. Julie tried to assure Tom that it wasn't what he thought, that she was just buying Vicodin from him. Tom briefly directed his attention to the man, who told him his name was Jim. Then Jim watched as Tom continued to berate Julie. In her original interview with Detective Brogy on April 3rd, Julie said they were just friends who met three months prior. Julie continued her story that Jim was her Vicodin dealer. Tom then gave her an ultimatum, quit her job at Seattle Gourmet Foods and come work for him at Tommy's Produce or else. The alternative wasn't clear. In any event, she agreed. Julie started work at Tommy's Produce in the last week of March. Tom was thrilled about it, but Julie apparently wasn't, according to Renee. The three were working in the same office, with Julie doing clerical work, filing paperwork, making phone calls, and taking orders. Renee noted that Julie was sad and upset about being there. Renee said Tom had tried his best to improve his marriage and confided in Renee about his efforts every day to improve the relationship. Having Julie working close to him was a step in that direction for Tom. In the weeks since the Durango affair, Julie advised Tom that she had to be at work until March 29th because she had to fill in for the office manager, who was going on vacation, which was true. Despite Julie's apparent sadness to Renee, it really appeared like things between Tom and Julie had improved. On Friday, April 1st, one day before Tom's death, Julie uploaded a photo of her and Tom together. Julie had her wedding ring on. No, life hasn't been good. Can you, can you fill me in more on that? Are, are you guys still, were you guys still not getting along? We or, were getting along better. I mean, we, we've been working on our marriage, yes. Okay. Um, all right, anything more notable than that? Or just, you know, it was getting better. It was getting better, yeah. Okay. So, we had decided, because we were going to split up, and we decided we're going to work on our marriage and stay together. But prosecutors would say the photo, which colleagues said was very unusual, was an attempt by Julie to belie the reality of the situation and to throw off the investigation. Interviews with family members and colleagues would quickly bring into the investigative fold the man named Bradley Robinson, who also went by his fake name Jim. Yes, Vicodin Jim. 
He was interviewed for many hours early in the investigation, and despite being accused of being involved, he denied being anywhere near the scene, which was corroborated by cell tower data. But he was honest about what had been going on behind the scenes. He even took detectives to a site near their workplace where he and Julie put a bag of love notes to each other, which date back to at least June 2015. The electronic communication started with the creation of two Yahoo email accounts, the exchanges from which were seized by investigators after getting a subpoena from Yahoo. The two used email for a significant part of their communications because Bradley couldn't afford a phone, though he would later get one after getting money from his wife's death. In the meantime, he used his Xbox at home and his work computer to type out communications. It turned out that, like Julie's experience with Tom, Bradley had a similarly bad experience with his late wife Leslie. He said Leslie had mental health problems, including bipolar disorder. He said she would be mad and in pain all the time. The couple had started sleeping in separate rooms beginning around 2014, he noted. The only thing that kept him from divorcing her, he said, was not being able to see his son Ryder. So he kept on keeping on until her death. Julie shared with Bradley that Tom once allegedly told her that if she divorces him, she won't get the house. That would only happen in the event of his death, she alleged, he said. And so it was against this backdrop that Julie made the seemingly offhand remark about Bradley being lucky to lose his wife. Julie was well aware that Bradley and his wife were sick in late February. He emailed her on the 29th saying, Leslie's getting worse, she can barely breathe. The morning after her passing at 7.46 a.m. on March 3rd, he emailed her again and said, Leslie never recovered from the flu. The relationship was in friend zone territory at first. They met while walking on a trail at lunch and then started their email communications that February. But they quickly bonded over their messy home lives, which brought them close. And in the context of two people who are already married, close is already close enough. They were soon getting caught by the supervisor alone in areas of the warehouse they had no business being in. The relationship, in other words, became sexual. On March 5th, 2016, just three days after Leslie's passing and the Durango affair, Julie emails Bradley, Love of mine, I know we are almost there, but we still have to take it slow out in public. You will still have to mourn her, she said, referring to Leslie. I hope that makes sense. How long will her mom be here? Is she going to stay with you? I love you. That last bit is important, so here's the context. On a couple of occasions, Julie went to Bradley's home to engage in sex. Bradley replies, My love, yes, take it really slow, very slow. But still, wow, we are closer than ever before. And when I can see time is more free, but nothing public for a while, I love you. But an affair is not illegal. And remember, this is a circumstantial case, so investigators and prosecutors needed to tie up those loose ends to show that it was Julie who killed her husband that night. They pointed to the pressure of the moment, which was apparent in the emails. In a nearly two-hour closing statement, senior prosecuting attorney Mary Barbosa showed through the trove of emails an increasingly frantic Julie, as she felt she was losing her grip on Bradley the longer she couldn't get away from Tom. Perhaps fearful that she will have to permanently fall back in a marriage she desperately wanted out of. March 22nd, 2016, Julie writes to Bradley, I'm sorry if I have done anything to bring you down. Please remember no matter what I say or where I go with him, I say or go to keep me safe. I do not love him and I just want to be with you. My feeling for you have not changed. Well, actually they have. I love you more than I ever have and I just want to be with you. You are the one that I want in my life. I love you so much. Less than an hour later, she continues. I also know that you are probably on a very emotional roller coaster. I also know that I wish I would have never stayed last year when I had the perfect chance to get out. I love you so much it hurts to not be able to be with you. I love you so much. March 24th, she writes, Well, let the phone calls begin. He has called and hung up once and then called back with an attitude. You know the weird part about it? It really doesn't bother me when he is treating me like crap. I have no reaction to it. I love you, and as long as you love me, I will be happy. Wow, I think this is actually going to happen. Less than an hour later, she adds, Love of mine, don't be sorry. This is just the extra push I needed. I cannot believe how much hate I feel for him. Then 17 minutes later, refers to him as her future husband. Two hours later, she writes, Love of mine, I want to get this clock started too. I'm actually feeling very relieved that it is finally ending. 
I love you so much, so very, very much. You are my everything. March 25th, Julie writes, Good news, we're fighting. March 26th, we just got into a fight. My kid and I have left. I love you so much. I will keep you informed about what's going on. He's just an asshole. March 28th, love of mine. Yes, I'm safe. My weekend was okay, nothing special. I'm just all mentally messed up right now. My situation is just really getting to me. I'm not understanding why I cannot just leave. I hate him so much and just cannot figure out why I stay. I love you so much. Recall that March 28th was inside the week where she returned to work for Tommy's Produce. She had lied to Tom and said she quit the job at Seattle Gourmet, but in reality, she told her supervisor and Bradley that it was only a vacation and that she would be returning on Monday, April 4th. Bradley then asks, My love, do you want to stay? Do you think you are stuck there for a while? She replies, No, I do not want to stay. I want to be with you. I feel stuck there. I'm not sure why, though. The prosecution contends it is this message that indicates Julie is feeling like Bradley is starting to doubt they are actually going to be together. Why are you taking it off? Because you were supposed to quit? Bradley asks about the vacation week. I'm sorry you are sad. Maybe don't focus on leaving as much. It sounds like you'll be there for a while. Julie responds by assuring him and saying that she's just mentally screwed up right now. Six days left. I hate that, Bradley writes on March 29th. Me too, she responded. Bradley asks her on March 30th what her plan is and whether it is safe. She writes, I'm being safe. I have people packing my stuff for me, then I'm out. I don't know if it is a safe plan or not, but it's my plan. I love you and miss you so much. It is important to note here that investigators found no evidence of any packing. The state argued that fact went to Julie's desperation to keep Bradley thinking that she was making moves to be with him. He then tells her, please be safe and I love you. What day will this take place? I love you and miss you so very much. She responds, I will be safe and I love you too. Not sure which day yet. All I'm sure of is I'm miserable without you. I love you with all my heart later saying that, I just hope after all of this you really think it was worth it. I love you. He responds, it's worth it, just be safe. Saying later, my love, I hope you can make it back on Monday, I miss you a lot. On April 1st, Julie tells Bradley that she'll try my best to see you this weekend and that she cannot wait to see you on Monday. To which Bradley says, I'm worried I won't see you again. On April 2nd at 5.34 p.m. or four hours before Tom's death, Julie writes, You will see me on Monday, if not at work, somewhere else. I love you. To which Bradley wishes her safety. He adds, Is this crazy? I'm being safe and yes, this is just crazy, she responds at 6.07 p.m. At 9.30 p.m., just minutes before Tom is believed to have been killed, Julie writes to Bradley, I miss you too and I love you. 10.08 p.m., minutes after Tom is believed to have been killed, Bradley writes, I love you loads, with a poop emoji. 10.36 p.m., Julie writes, LOL, I love you too. Then the last text from Bradley comes at 10.53 p.m., the exact time Julie calls 911. I miss you so much. Prosecutors charged that these emails were far different than the ones she sent to him before the Durango affair. She showed more desperation, started talking about being mentally messed up, and felt the need to constantly assure Bradley that she was moving on, as she felt that Bradley was pulling away. Then Tom learned that Julie didn't actually quit her job at Seattle Gourmet, compounding an already tense situation that put her between a rock and a hard place. Both Tom expecting her at Tommy's Produce and Bradley expecting her at Seattle Gourmet by Monday, April 4th. The state alleged Julie chose to commit to the latter, on March 27, 2019, Julie was charged with the murder of Tom Anicello. Julie's trial was held in the summer of 2022, but a jury could not reach a unanimous verdict and a mistrial was declared in September of that year. The state of Washington versus Julie Ann Anicello went to a second trial in February of this year. Prosecutors alleged that it all happened before Julie and her children left to pick up Amber that April 2nd night. Felicia and Tabitha were already in the blue Kia listening to the radio and chatting as they waited for their mom to put Amber's cat Mau Mau back inside. When she came back out, the kids told Julie that she forgot to close the door next to the front sliding glass door. She was gone a second time. 
In total, prosecutors say Julie was inside for between 5 and 10 minutes, long enough to shoot Tom, wash up, and stage a burglary. By the time Julie was in the car, it was roughly 9.55 p.m. She made sure to tell the kids that she kissed her father on the forehead. Had she driven straight to Home Depot, she would have been able to pick up Amber on time. Instead, she dragged out the trip by first unnecessarily stopping by her parents' place and then nearly half an hour later picking up Amber. Then when they were returning home, she unnecessarily took the longer route back. Before and after the incident, prosecutors charged, Julie was attempting to manipulate people and get the heat off of her. The cheery Facebook photo of her wearing her wedding ring and standing next to Tom the day before his murder was intended to lead people to believe she didn't have a motive to kill him, the state said. She never posted photos with him on her Facebook page, and she hadn't been wearing her wedding ring at work, colleagues alleged. Her telling people around her, including detectives, that her relationship with Tom was strengthening in his final week was a form of manipulation, the state added. Same with her telling him that her affair with Bradley was ending. The day before, she allegedly told Amber, I don't love your father anymore. Then on the morning of the murder, the dichotomy in how she communicated with Tom and Bradley was cutting. At 7.11 a.m., Tom texts Julie, Good morning, my love. At 9.12 a.m., Julie emails Brad, I miss you too. And then she adds, Love of mine, I'm going to be safe. I promise I love you. At 9.36 a.m., she finally responds to Tom with a simple, Morning. At 10.28 a.m., she writes to Bradley, Love of mine, did you get a good night's sleep last night? I did, finally. First night in weeks, I've slept really good. Julie's case wasn't helped by the fact that she lied a lot throughout. She alleged that Tom forced her to Google, What happens if I die without a will? What do my children get if there's no will? And what happens to a business if there is no will? She tried to say that Tom had a cousin who passed away, which was true. The problem was that Darren didn't have a business. The state also argued that she tried to prevent people from saying anything to authorities. For example, during one of her initial interviews with the detective that night, she shouts at Amber not to call her grandparents. Here's another example. After the shooting, while she was at Walmart, she ran into Bradley, who was there to get a toy for Ryder. Julie whipped out an envelope full of cash and gave him $20. When he asked her where she got that from, she told him not to tell anyone about it. The state said she feared it would be used against her as a motive in the crime. The state also argued that no one in the neighborhood heard the Anicello dogs bark and they were known to bark at everything, suggesting there was no intruder. As for why no one heard the gunshot, prosecutors brought forward witness testimony that said while a 9mm round being fired is loud, the sound waves would have had to penetrate multiple walls, which reduces the decibels. If the gunshot was heard at all, which isn't necessarily always the case, it wouldn't have necessarily been distinguishable from ambient or other sounds, the witness testified. The defense did not try to argue self-defense or battered wife syndrome. Instead, it went with the general denial defense. The overarching argument is that investigators got tunnel vision when they discovered the affair with Bradley. It pointed to an incomplete follow-through on Thomas Cooley, the vagabond who was found sleeping under the neighbor's trailer. In late 2023, detectives tried to get Thomas's major prints, which is a more fulsome impression of his hand, to completely rule him out but he was uncooperative when he heard what the case was about. The defense also argued, among other points, that there was no evidence found in the Kia, that Julie was fully cooperative, that no witness testimony ever came forward that Julie handled guns, and that the emails didn't indicate that the two were actually serious about being together. Instead, the defense argued, the online communications were just a momentary escape from the lives with which they weren't satisfied. The jury disagreed. On February 9th, 2024, Juliana Cello was found guilty of murder in the first degree, with enhancements including her use of a firearm and domestic violence. Julie is scheduled to be sentenced on April 22nd, 2024. The state is asking for at least 28 years, which is the middle of the standard range for the state of between 25 and nearly 32 years. The state offered two mitigating factors in Julie's favor, that she has no previous felonies, and that she was reportedly the subject of some domestic violence in the volatile relationship she ended with murder. Julie's family members, including her daughters, have sent letters to the court supporting the mother they said would never kill. 
They had previously pleaded to have her bond reduced from the $5 million it was set at because they simply couldn't manage the day-to-day -day without her, including running the business, which eventually shuttered without Julie's assistance. Tabitha pleaded especially hard because she was tasked with taking care of her elderly grandparents. Jean Shefflin passed away in November 2023. She said she has no financial support anymore and has become clinically depressed, anxious, stressed out, and she suffers from severe insomnia and recurring nightmares. Her grades, she said, have also been slipping. I cannot mentally or physically picture the thought of my mother pulling a trigger on my dad, Tabitha wrote in one March 2024 letter. They may have been a horrible couple, but they were amazing parents, and I know neither of them would ever do something like this and hurt their three daughters. Amber similarly said she can't imagine her mom was the one to pull the trigger. I need my mom back home ASAP because she's my mom and I need her. I'm 36 years old and just had my first baby in December of 2023. I would love my daughter to have her grandma in her life, like I had mine. I need my mom to come home for emotional support and mom advice for my daughter. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to listen to me narrate this story, which is based on the primary sources. Special mention must go to the local reporters who bring light to these cases, to the court clerks for doing their thing, and to you guys for offering your perspective on the subject matter. I hope you all are well, you are doing nice things for strangers, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.